This is week two on a brand new series uh, called The Everlasting Kingdom of God. By the time we get done with this, you will be so kingdom-minded that you will be earthly good, right? That's, that's, you know, you've heard people say, I'm so, you know, I'm so heavenly-minded and I'm no earthly good. No, no, no. No, when you're heavenly-minded, you'll be good for people down here, Right? You'll be led by the Spirit of God. You'll walk in the authority of the Lord. You'll walk by the faith of God. Walk in the strength of God. Walk yielded to the love of God. Right? Walk in the anointing of God. Helping others get free. Right? Not moved by anything. You'll actually walk like Jesus did when he was on the earth. Hallelujah. Well, let me review just a little bit from last week. Real quick, last week, and I would encourage you, we're going to get real thorough, and I really have a sense that this is not going to be a real short series. You know, you guys are laughing because we don't really have a lot of short series around here, right? But I got to tell you, I don't, I don't know how long we'll teach on this, you know? It would be okay if we got interrupted in September and we just got raptured. That'd be great, but if we, if we don't, we're probably going to keep going. Who knows, right? The purpose of Jesus coming in the flesh, the purpose, was to bring the kingdom of God to this earth and get it into the hearts of men, right? Adam lost it, Jesus got it back. That was the purpose of Jesus coming. You know, I grew up thinking, well, you know, Jesus just came to die for man's sins. He did, and that's a massive part. But he came for the purpose of bringing the kingdom of heaven to this earth and getting it in the hearts of man. So to do that, he had to die for mankind, right? Principle number one, remember we went through three principles last week. Principle number one, in creation, man was to administer the kingdom of God on this earth. That was God's original plan. He doesn't change. That never changed. Even when Adam and Eve messed it up, it still never changed. He had a plan in place. Principle number two, the fall of man was a loss of the kingdom of God on this earth. Authority was transferred over to Satan, a created being, the destroyer, a fallen angel. Okay? Principle number three, the purpose of redemption, again, was to restore the kingdom of God on the earth and to restore man into that kingdom. This is the foundation of everything that we're talking about. Now, when you think about that, you got to ask yourself, why are we not, from our pulpits, hearing this a lot? Because we need to. Because if we don't get kingdom-minded, we're going to just think we're just living down here for our little thing and, and we're just, you know, we won't, we won't discern the Lord's body correctly, right? When we do that, when we talk about it in communion, we won't discern that we are part of the kingdom of God that was planted in this earth and literally it's, it is, it's all over the earth and it's growing and increasing we are part of the body of Christ on this earth. The enemy hates the church. Look at all that's going on in the world today. I mean, it's, the volume has been turned up. And I got to tell you, this, this group that's going to be hated above everybody, if the word of God is true, it's going to be the church. Right? Why is that? Because Satan wants to stop the church, but he can't. I mean, every time he hits the church, the church gets stronger. Every time he comes out one way, he flees seven ways and the kingdom advances. You got to understand when you're kingdom minded, you realize that, wait a minute, I am part of the body of Christ. Yeah, you're planted at Faith Family Church. That's great. But you are part of the bigger body of Christ in the earth, right? Right? So now we don't talk bad about our brothers and sisters just because they might believe a little different, right? We don't get upset if they sprinkle somebody. We keep our eye on the ball, right? Yes. 
I'm telling you, we have to get kingdom-minded. Otherwise, we will get caught up in this world. Your career, your family, all that's going on. What are we going to do? God does not want you to be concerned about that at all. As you run your race, you are to literally fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the initiator of your faith. Why is that? Because faith comes by hearing his word. It's the only way faith comes. He's also, it says the finisher, really the Greek word is more accurately depicted, he's the developer of your faith, right? His spirit on the inside of you as you walk, as the enemy comes against you, as, you, as, as God puts things on your heart to believe him for, as, as revelation knowledge of his word grows in you, your faith is developed. Who's developing your faith? You? No. No, no, Jesus is, right? So we keep our eyes on him. The Bible says if we don't, we're going to become faint and wearied in our minds. This is Hebrews chapter 12. So this, we have to be kingdom-minded. The redemptive plan of Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Actually, the redemptive plan of Jesus, death, burial, resurrection, and everything he's doing right now at the right hand of God as our intercessor, as our advocate, as our high priest, all of this was to restore the kingdom of God that was lost. And it's restored. It's being restored. It's growing every day. Isn't that good news? I know it's growing every day because I'm growing every day. There's people getting saved all over the world. There's miracles happening all over the world. Hallelujah. God, God's plan for man was to administrate his kingdom on this earth. You want to know what God's called you to? You are called. You are a king and a priest, and you're called to administer the kingdom on this earth. I'm telling you, learning about the kingdom will change and transform your identity. You won't, you won't look at yourself as a mere man. Oh, you're human, but that's not all you are. You're a child of God. Amen? This is a big one. So, having said all that, I want you to really hear this next statement. This is something the Lord just told me, backed up by tons of scripture as we're going to go through it. Not understanding these three principles in creation, right? Man was to administer the kingdom of God on the earth. P number two, the fall of man was a loss of the kingdom. Principle number three, the purpose of redemption was to restore the kingdom on this earth and to restore man into the kingdom. Amen. Not understanding these principles will cause you to be stuck in religion, I say it this way, either in religion or in a works mentality, and will put you, as every false doctrine does, in a passive position against the enemy. You're never to be passive with him. We seize hold of the blessings of God. When sickness attacks your body, you seize hold of your healing. Right? No, nothing passive. Now, if you believe that God heals some and others and not others, that's a false doctrine. It's not Bible. It puts you in a passive position. You can't believe God. What if it's God's will not to heal you? Right? That's why we look to the word of God. We find his will and we're like, whoa, wait a minute. This attack against my physical body is illegal. Jesus bore this. I don't have to. I'm no longer passive, I'm aggressive now. Now, Satan, you take your hands off my body. Body, you come in line with the word of God. Sickness, disease, pain, whatever it is, you get out of my body and out of my life, right? Amen. And you can do that in every different one. Prosperity, finances, mental health, all of these things. You look to the word of God. Faith begins where the word of God is known. Not understanding these principles will cause you to be stuck in religion or in a works mentality and will put you in a passive position against the enemy instead of living in dominion and in the authority, in the name of Jesus, 
and be an overcomer in every area of your life, not understanding these principles. You're either, if you understand them and that revelation grows, you will, the, the dominion that you walk in will grow. Your ability to stand in the authority and use the name of Jesus will increase. And what will that look like in your life? You'll walk as an overcomer in life. There is nothing about the Zoe life of God that's passive. The Zoe life of God that Jesus came to give us is not win some and lose some. No, no, undefeated. That's God's will for your life. Isn't that good news? So what is a kingdom? The very word kingdom, king, what is that? A monarch or a ruler. Dumb, that means dominion. The very word means the dominion of a king or a ruler. That's what a kingdom means. It literally is a territory or people who are subject to the rule of the king. We are in the kingdom of God. We are subject to the rule of our king. What does that mean? Whatever he says goes and we have a good king because he says i always cause you to triumph i always give you the victory healing is yours your path is one of increase you submit yourself to me and resist your enemy and he will flee like he's in terror i am under i am subject to the rule of my king this word kingdom means the governing influence of a king over his territory. This governing influence, what does it do? It impacts this territory, listen to this, with his personal will, with his personal purpose, and his personal intent. Look at the world today. Look at these nations that have, that have unrighteous rulers. How would you like to live in China? No thank you, right? How would you like to live in North Korea? No thank you, right? Why? Unrighteous ruler. People don't have rights. Satanic leadership is this. And, and, and let me tell you a little bit about the world. Paul, you know, Paul used the Greek words for the earth. He called it a satanic slave market. And ever since, ever since the serpent beguiled Eve in the garden, that serpent has been trying to create a satanic slave market in the earth. To where it's really crazy because it's a few living one way and telling the masses what they're going to wear, where they're going to go, what they're going to do. But the reality, like in our system, even these few who think they're the elite, like they're in this inner circle with Satan, read your Bible. They're not. He's a killer. He's a destroyer. Satanic leadership is always, I'm going to live this way, but you're, you're not, right? We have, to, we have to be conscious of this in our day because that's happening all over the world. Godly leadership is our God in the kingdom of God. This is what our God says. I want you to live like me. I want you to have everything that I have. I want you to have the very quality of life that I, as the creator of the universe, have. Now, we're not gods. We're his kids. Isn't that good news? We have to get this, a revelation in our heart. Because I'm telling you, you and I are living at a time, and we're going to even see this tonight if we have time. We are living at a time where we're going to see the greatest glory of God. Because we're living at the end of human history right now. And I'm telling you, but on the outside, it may look kind of crazy at times. And to that, whatever. 
because it's not going to come near me because I understand that I'm on assignment here and my God will take care of me, right? No man will take my life. Now, I'm willing to lay it down, right? Dr. Barclay, he, he told me one time, he called me up, he says, hey, you know, we're living in a time where pastors, you got to decide what hill you're willing to die on. And I said, oh man, doc, I've already decided that one. I died once, and the result of that death was awesome. I got born again, right? So I don't fear any other physical death. Because the minute you separate me from my body, I'm with Jesus. But nobody's stealing my life, right? So this is what we're talking about. See, this governing influence of a king, it produces... In the kingdom, it, because of his will, his intent, his purpose, ruling. Now, this is where you and I are. The problem is, if we don't know, we're buying lies of the enemy and we're living way below what we could be living at. But this produces culture, a culture of freedom, a culture of victory, a culture of health. It produces values. We have different values. It produces morals. The church, we have different morals. Where do we get that? We get that from our king. He's holy. Right? So, so because I'm in the kingdom, he's like, now you live holy, and guess what? I will empower you to live holy. All you got to want to do is want it. I've made you this way. I love that. Here's another one. It produces the lifestyle that reflects the king's desire and nature for his children. It reflects it. In the kingdom of God, our life, our Father's will, Jesus' will is that our life reflects the desire and the very nature of our king. Is there anything in God that would ever be lack? Ever be confusion? Ever would be stress and toil, sickness, disease, poverty? No, that is not his intent. That is not his desire. You're going to see as the world's economies don't you kind of get a feeling like there's something behind a lot of this stuff? Yeah, there is. But you gotta, don't, don't get into this thing where you're looking at, well, the people, we could name some names, but it's really one name. Satan, the destroyer, right? But as he's trying to steal and kill and destroy, I'm telling you, you're going to see the greatest wealth. You're going to see people that God's going to make wealthy and it's going to blow people away how much they sow. People will be looking at him going, what are you doing? Why don't you keep more for yourself? He's like, listen, I can't give it away fast enough. The more, the more I sow, the more I get. Right? I got to the point where all of a sudden I started being able to give people money and then I started being able to pay people's rent and then pretty soon I started being able to give them cars and, and, and help them give them houses and, and start ministries, and right? Because there is no limit. But the one thing we know about the kingdom of God, and we're going to get into Daniel tonight and we're going to see it, this kingdom is ever increasing until all the nations of this world all the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our god unstoppable is what you have a part in so the bible it'll and we're going to see this as we go through scriptures it contrasts the kingdom of god and the kingdom of men you'll see these terms it'll contrast these two things it'll contrast the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth Okay, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is mentioned only 150 times. This is, this is why this can't be a four-part series, right? 
I mean, it's, it, this is massive, what Jesus wanted us to know about the kingdom. After he was resurrected, he was on this earth for 40 days before he left. And what he went about doing was talking to people about the kingdom. It was the last thing. He's like, you got to know about the kingdom. Talk to most Christians today, and you mention the kingdom of God, they'll be like, what, what are you talking about? Could you give me three verses about the kingdom? No. Right? Well, not us. We're going to know all about the kingdom. So let's go to Daniel chapter 2 tonight. Now, you could get stuck for weeks in Daniel. So this is not an end-time prophetic study. I don't know that I could ever do a verse-by-verse study in Daniel. We would, maybe in the millennial reign, I'll have a thousand years or something. I don't know. You know, it, it, there's so much here. But I want you to show King Nebuchadnezzar, the, the king of Babylon, had this dream that freaked him out. And none of his, none of his court, None of his magicians, none of his sorcerers, none of his, quote, holy men or religious men could tell him what this dream was, and Daniel interpreted this dream. This dream was literally about every kingdom that would be throughout human history. That's what this, this vision was about, or this dream was about. So I want to just read a few verses here in Daniel chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 31. And this is Daniel, verse 31. He's telling the king what he saw. So Daniel is revealing this dream to the king. How did Daniel do that? God told him. So he says this, Thou, O king, saw and beheld a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before you. And the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold. This represented the kingdom of Babylon, which Nebuchadnezzar was over. Okay? God is revealing every major kingdom that would be until the end of human history. Okay? His breast or his chest and his arms were of silver. The next major kingdom that came up was the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. His belly and his thighs of brass. This was the kingdom of ancient Greece, where Alexander the Great conquered the whole known world. Okay? His legs of iron. This is talking about the ancient Roman Empire. Okay, so we're down to his legs, and we're talking about the ancient Roman Empire was a couple thousand years ago. So literally, we have went from Adam and Eve now all the way to 2,000 years ago. So for 4,000 years, now we're at 2,000 years ago when Jesus came on the scene. Now we're down to the feet His feet were part of iron and part of clay. This is talking about the restored Roman Empire. And this is the last one mentioned. It's interesting that the president of France got up less than two weeks ago. He's serving his term as the head of the European Union, which is... If you look at all those territories, it's amazing. It's all the territories of the Roman Empire. And he made this statement. He says, what we need is a revival of the Roman Empire, but we need it to be stronger and greater. Guys, we're seeing prophecy. We're living right now during this time. His feet, part of iron and part of clay. This is the restored Roman Empire. That's the last one. The United Nations is the the military arm of that. The European Union's headquarter building, it's an exact replica of the Tower of Babel. That's interesting. 
sure that's just a coincidence. <laughs> right? Just, you know. Verse 34. You saw till that a stone was cut out without hands. So all of a sudden, after you see this image, you see a stone that was cut out without hands. So in other words, somebody cut out a stone but didn't use their hands. What, what does God use when he does things? He uses his mouth. God did this. What is the stone? It's the kingdom of God. It's a stone. Okay? Which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay. This is right where we're living. The kingdom of God smote this revised Roman Empire. But man, it was so, the, the iron and the clay were just so big and bad, this little stone couldn't mess with it. Is that what it says? No. Nope. It says the stone broke this iron and clay, the revised Roman Empire, broke it into pieces. That's right. And I'm telling you, Phineas, that is the key. We all have to know that that's right. Right now it appears like the world is so big and bad, and what are we going to do? But the, real, the big thing is, listen, this stone... We might not look like much. But you know, we're all part of this stone. It wasn't made with hands. It's not natural. I mean, you sit there and look in the mirror, what you need to realize is, man, the very Holy Spirit of Almighty God dwells in me. The all-powerful one. Wow. When he came upon me in the baptism of the Holy Spirit... What was released upon me was dunamis power, miraculous power that's already been released. Wow. So it broke the, the iron and clay into pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken in pieces together, not only broken, and became like chaff of the summer fleshing, threshing floors. That's like dust. Not only did it crumble it, it literally rent it into dust just so that it could never, ever, ever, ever become this statue again. Wow. Isn't that something? And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. Wow. And the stone that smote the image, look at this, became a great mountain. See, the path of the righteous is one of increase. Why? Because the kingdom of God increases Everything in God increases. Right? They've been selling this thing for years. Man, we got to conserve oil because it's fossil fuel. You know, the dinosaurs made it and we could run out. Listen, nothing that God made in this earth ever runs out. Amen. There's nothing about everything God creates. It, it literally propitiates. It, it grows. Everything about you grows. You're, you're to grow in revelation. You're to grow in your knowledge of God. The anointing is to grow on you. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, it grows. Everything grows. The kingdom that we are in will start out as a stone. Guess what? We're 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years into it. We are at the end. It's going to grow into a big mountain and filled the whole earth. What's going to fill the whole earth? 
the kingdom that you are in and the kingdom that is in you. So now let's jump to verse 44. And in the days of these kings, Daniel 2.44, isn't this thrilling? I hope tonight you're just like, is it, is it next Wednesday yet? Right? And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. See, this is what you need to see. God set up his kingdom in the midst of all this other stuff. So don't be bothered by the other stuff. And don't let the other stuff bother you. Satan can't have the United States of America while we're here. Is, do you, right? And, and not only that, we're going to send money all over the world and we're going to help other countries, the kingdom to grow there. So these people stand up and go, you can't have Africa. Right? You can't have Russia. You can't, right? That's what we're doing. And all, and, 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 and I'm sorry, and in these days, these kings shall, the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. Why? Because we never die. We're eternal. We are kings and priests in the kingdom of God. We're not leaving this inheritance of the kingdom to somebody else because we're not going to die. Are you starting to see a little bit about who you are? Wow. This is almost too good to be true. Yeah, it's the gospel, right? I love this. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. I love the Holy Spirit as he inspires things. He just said that a few verses ago, but man, he was so excited, he just had to say that again. It'll consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Isn't that cool? Don't be timid. Wherever you go, be conscious. I'm bringing the kingdom here. Yeah, but God's called me to a dark place. Of course he has. But the moment you get there, it's no longer dark. And the more you realize that, the more you realize that you are there to bring the kingdom, right? Didn't God say every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon have I given you? Wow. So God sets up his kingdom in the midst of other kingdoms. So don't be moved by all this stuff. It's not going to get worse for you and I. Now, it may, look, it may look worse on the outside. Don't be moved by that. Right? Man, I love the fact that God has ministering angels sent forth to minister for those who are heirs of salvation. You have angels. You know, the first thing an angel says when he appears to a man is fear not. Why? Because these guys are massive. They're not little babies with little wings, and they don't have like little arrows. No, right? I've told this story before. Gosh, I'm just going to take my time. I told the story before about a pastor in Mount Pleasant. He was out in a boat uh, with uh, some leaders in his church, and they were water skiing with their, their kids, and they were all water skiing. And so, you know, if you've ever water skied, I've only done it once, uh, and I fell. And my personality is I fell forward. And I'm one of these guys that I'm not letting go. I mean, I'm like under the water, you know, and finally I realize I got to let go. Right? You know, most people don't do that. But anyway, so one of the sons of these leaders in the church was just being really rebellious. He was, he was just out doing his own thing, really wanted nothing to do with God. So he's, he's water skiing. And the way it works is when you fall, what, you, know, you know what happens. You're just kind of floating there because you got a vest on. 
and then the boat kind of comes around, gets you, you know, you grab on and you try again, whatever, right? So anyway, he falls, and so they go to make a circle to come back around and get him, and all of a sudden, when they turned, all the parents, everybody in the boat goes, oh my gosh, there's this speedboat flying right towards their son, and they can't do anything. The son, they see the son freaking out, freaking out. He's like, oh my God, he can't get away. You can't dive down because you have a vest on. And he, I mean, he's literally petrified. He's like, oh my gosh, my life's over. And literally, all of a sudden, all they saw on the boat was this boat just go right over the top of them. Just bam. What they didn't know was right before the boat hit him, this young man who was rebellious but thank God he had praying parents. Two gigantic hands grabbed him. He didn't say by the ankles because the hands were so big. Grabbed him in between the knee and the ankle and just pulled him right down. So this kid just goes way under the water and he sees the boat go across. And then the hands just let him go. So the parents are just freaking you could imagine, you just saw your son die. Next thing you know, he pops out. And he's totally fine. He was no longer a rebellious teenager. That's all I'll say about that. Those angels are there. So let's look at this. Verse 45, as thrilling as verse 44 was. Oh, I got to tell you this story too. Dr. Barkley just told me this story. This is amazing. Pastor, actually, Dr. Barkley didn't tell me this story. Pastor Dave let me listen to Dr. Barkley who gave this testimony publicly. His granddaughter, they're, they're in a pool, little girl, long hair. Her hair, she, she, you know, she's sticking her head over by this filter. Her hair gets wrapped up and it pulls her right against underneath the water. And, and, you know, finally the little kids are like, hey, dad or whatever, so-and-so, she's not moving. So the dad runs over there, grabs a little girl, rips her out, you know, not, not being concerned about hair, puts her on the side of the pool, lifeless. Been under the water a long time, right? I don't know how long. I mean, when I say a long time, it could be a minute, two minutes, three minutes, right? That's, you, you can't, it, it, yeah. So they're, he's trying to revive her. They call 911. The paramedics get there minutes later. They're working on her. And at one point, the paramedic, just nothing. It's been a long time. They're basically like, if she comes back to life now, she'll be brain dead. But there's no way we have to pronounce her dead. And, and looks over at the mother and just kind of nods his head like this. So that would have been Doc, Doc Barclay's daughter. Her husband, his son-in-law, screams, No! Satan, you cannot kill my daughter. We are tithers. And this little girl goes, oh, And jumps up and just like, Hey, what's... Totally normal. So they had already called the hospital said there's a do not, you know, there's a dead on arrival coming. So they, they, they're like, okay, they check this little girl out. She's fine, but they're like, you know, we need to take her just to check her out at the hospital. They, they put her in the back of the ambulance. They take her down. Doctor meets him. He goes, okay, we're, you know, the little girl gets out. And she's just like, fine. And, and he's like, we're, he's talking to the paramedics. Where's the little girl who died? Uh, and they're like, they don't know the Lord. They're like, um, the, sh that's her right there. The more you're kingdom-minded, the more you will understand what you've been given and who you are, and you'll walk in dominion and as an overcomer in life. A couple examples. Verse 45 of Daniel chapter 2. For as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, 
the great God hath made known to the king. Daniel is saying this to Nebuchadnezzar. What shall come to pass hereafter? And the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. Wow. Now let's fast forward and talk about our future. This is our very soon future. Revelation eleven fifteen. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world. Now, we're up in heaven right now. We're at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And all of a sudden, at the end of this seven-year tribulation period, which is to very shortly start on the earth, we're raptured out of here before, we're up in heaven, all of a sudden, we start hearing great voices a seventh angel sounded there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our lord and of his christ and he shall reign forever and ever wow revelation verse 21 let me read these five verses to you now What happened after what I just read is now we come back with Jesus and he doesn't come back to meet us in the clouds because we're now with him. Now he comes back to the earth, literally the second coming. The Bible says that the sky will roll back like a scroll and there will be the Son of Man. His vesture will be dipped in blood and his name is the Word of God. And he's coming to judge. He's coming to set up his kingdom right? He sets up his kingdom. We go into an a thousand year millennial reign of Christ. And now this is our a little bit distant future, a little over a day from now, because a thousand years to the Lord is like a day, right? So now at the end of the millennial reign, look at this. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. I'm still trying to deal with that one. I have a feeling there might be a planet that has waves and oceans and who knows. I don't know. But literally, when it says passed away, this this Greek word, it literally means to change from one condition to another. The earth is going to be so messed up, and the word heaven means the initial atmosphere, It's going to be so messed up with probably nuclear war, all this stuff that went on in the seven-year tribulation period. And so now God is going to renovate. He's going to, with fire, the whole earth and make a new heaven and a new earth, clean the atmosphere, all this stuff. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. So now the new Jerusalem is coming down from heaven. I'm going by memory, but wrap your, wrap your mind around this one. It's 1,500 miles wide. It's 1,500 miles deep. And it's 1,500 miles high. So now, Jay, you're a pilot. You fly at about 40,000 feet. How many miles is that? Is that about, what, eight, seven, seven miles? And you're pretty high up there. We're talking 1,500 miles. <laughs> right? And we wonder if God could pay our electric bill. <laughs> wow. We need mind renewal, right? It says, I saw this holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Oh, wait a minute. You mean, I thought we were the the bride of Christ. I guess the New Jerusalem's the bride of Christ? No, it says it was adorned as a bride. It doesn't say it's the bride. We're the bride. But what that means, have you ever seen a bride? Man, I'm telling you, December 30th, this year, I will have been married 33 years. I remember like it was yesterday. I'm standing, I'm in Dana Point, standing there with my pastor. Everybody rises and the doors opened. And I saw my bride. We have a picture of it. We have a picture of of my bride and and I 
in, in our bedroom. Man, I had never seen something so beautiful in my life, right? I still say that about her. But it's like the city's going to be adorned. It's going to be coming out of heaven. The end of the millennial reign of Christ. The earth will be brand new. The atmosphere, we will have never seen anything so beautiful. I mean, go, we go to places on the earth that we consider very pretty. Do you realize it's still, on its best day, the valley of the shadow of death? Everything's dying. It's interesting. And it says here, as a bride adorned for her husband, verse 3, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself will, shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Think about that. Anything that could bring sorrow, the thought of loved ones that didn't make heaven, all, everything, all tears will be wiped away. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, no crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. I wonder if this God is willing to restore a broken life and make it new right now. Absolutely. He never changes. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true, these words are faithful. The kingdom of God, in other words, brings God's will over the whole earth. Wow. Wow. That was so good. We better go one more chapter. Let's read a little bit more about our future. This is your future. Don't get caught up in your present. Because when you see your future and you realize who your God is, your present looks pretty good. Because he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And you're to have Zoe life right now. You're to have days of heaven on this earth. Revelation 22, look at these five verses. Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, and in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. So here's this river of pure living water, and it's another picture of Psalm 1-3. We'll be like a tree planted by rivers of water. But now you've got trees of life, literally, planted by this river flowing out of the throne of God and it yields a different fruit 12 different fruit i wonder if that fruit would taste good Whew. i wonder if that water would taste good right look at this and yielded her fruit every month and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations and there would and there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no more night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. Why did Adam and Eve say, oh my gosh, we're naked? Because the light that was coming out of them, the light that was coming out of their spirit that illuminated them went out. But look at this, the Lord giveth them light. We won't need, I mean, when you walk in a room, guess what? You won't need light. Because the light that God gave you will light everything. 
I love that thing about, you know, the leaves, the trees. The leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. Now there's no more sickness, there's no more disease. Could this be a major memorial that God was and always, always was a healer? That, that's, I don't know. There shall be no more night there. They need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. This is your future. So I'm just going to say a couple things to, so that we could launch off next week into this. So having said all this, Satan's kingdom manifests through the kingdoms of this world right satan's kingdom manifests through these kingdoms satan's will of stealing killing and destroying is being done in his kingdom so don't get mad at the people use your authority against who's behind it right Keep your eye on the ball. We, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood ever in our life. The kingdom of God manifests through the church in this earth. God manifests through his church. When you focus on what is important to God, you step into a greater anointing. You know, I, I, was, I, I, was, I was on a church staff, and every week we would go through John Maxwell's leadership stuff. I've read every book that he ever wrote up to years ago, right? And, and, and after a while, when you read these books, you're like, okay, all these books really kind of sound the same, and there's some great leadership principles, and leadership is very, very important. He will make the statement over and over, everything rises and falls on leadership. And I, I think leadership is massively important. But I'm here to tell you tonight, everything rises and falls on the anointing. Everything rises and falls on the anointing. Now, you need leadership principles. That's great, and that's wonderful, but you got to, it's the anointing. And that anointing is increased only one way, it's, it's increased by faithfulness. It's increased by seeking first the kingdom. So this is why I'm saying this to you as your pastor. When you focus on what is important to God, you step into a greater anointing. The more important... See, you know what's really important to God on this earth? People. People. And when that becomes important to you, the more important it becomes, the greater the anointing. He's looking for people that he can move through and minister to because Jesus died for everyone. Our time on earth is so brief. The thing that matters is what we do with our time on this earth and how it relates to the kingdom. That's everything. That's how come we have to become kingdom-minded. The more valuable your time is to the kingdom of God, the more valuable your time is to God. Do you see that? Believers that are just out there living for themselves, there's very little anointing, there's very little God can do because you know, they can't lay hold of anything that God's given them, or very little. Now, God still is always trying to bless. But if you want to increase in your life, the more value, more valuable your time is to the kingdom of God, the more valuable your time is to God, the more God will take responsibility to help you protect your time. If you're just out there and you're not kingdom-minded, man, I'm telling you, you'll waste your life. But when God sees somebody seeking first the kingdom and, care and loving people and, and caring about ministry and all this stuff, 
He will help that person. Right? These, these ministers that go all over the place, that's why, you know, God did not give the technology for airplanes and jets and all this stuff so that corporate executives can just fly around the world. No, it's, it's so, that, so that a minister, instead of dealing with major airports and wiping himself out, there's like, there's so many more little airports they could get everywhere. They could see more people. They could stay fresh. Right? God will work overtime. As you seek first the kingdom, God will work overtime to protect your time. The more he does things to give you the equipment, the resources, and the opportunities to release and protect your time. When we back off and focus on ourselves, our time is not as important to the kingdom of God. Therefore, it's not as important to God. Do you see that? This is, this is a huge thing. What am I saying to you? That God has favorites? Nope, that's not what I'm saying. God wants to move in every one of his kids' lives and make it better. And make your time protect it, give you resources. You know, I mean, think about like when we were in building programs, the amount of time that, you know, I spend believing God and, and trusting God and, and doing all this stuff. I, I mean, you know, and, and, and like when we moved in this building, okay, looking at everything and going, okay, we're not going to ever be that church. We're not going to make a commitment to a contractor and not follow through. So we had to. I had to approve everything, because, but man, would it have been a lot easier to just have about 10 times the money and just, you know, you'll see this. If, if the Lord has us doing other things in other buildings or whatever, man, I'm telling you, we're going to do it debt-free, and, and, and I, I'm not going to be overseeing finances. I'll, I'm, I'll have a meeting once a week, but, you know, we got to keep our eye on the ball. In your life, God doesn't want you to get your eye off the ball of ministry. In whatever, in whatever, things can happen in life, circumstances could happen, but they are never to dominate you. You are to have dominion over them. The key is seeking first the kingdom. I would encourage you, what's one way to seek first the kingdom? Let the first thing you do every day is to spend time with God. Get in the word. Pray. Spend some time with him. Go throughout your day in the middle of the day. You spend some more time with him. While you're at work and while you're doing things, you want to be real productive at work? Pray in the spirit. Right? Get some scriptures that you could just, you just have and, and you just keep speaking them. Every time it comes up, you'll get more done at work than you've ever got done. Then, in the evening, before you go to bed, spend, spend more time with him. Right? But in the morning, make yourself available to him. Okay, Lord, I am all about your kingdom. I want to yield all my fruit in my season. So I'm available. I'm available to tell anybody you want me to tell about what you've done in my life. To be a witness for you. Open doors of utterance to me. So that I could speak to people about you, invite people to church, you know, encourage them, pray for them, whatever. Every day do that. See what happens in your life. I could tell you this, your, your life will increase. You believe in God for healing? Get very adamant. Fall in love with your brothers and sisters that are here. Find out who's believing God. Get their name. And just spend some time praying for them. Ask the Holy Spirit to stir you. I'm telling you, you'll get your eyes so off yourself and on the kingdom and ministry, you'll forget about doing ministry. You'll forget about it because you'll just be doing ministry. You won't be all caught up in titles, all that nonsense. You'll just be light. And you know, you won't be perfect. 
Remember, a spiritually mature person is one who adjusts and repairs. You'll get in the flesh a little bit, but then your spirit will just jump you back and go, what are you doing? And, and God will be pleased, and he'll move in your life. And you'll see things increase that you have never dreamed of. Amen?